This year, all the Great Lakes were near or above record highs each month over the summer. But just a few short years ago, there was equal concern over how low the lake levels were. What's behind such volatility and how much of a role does climate change play? Drew Grunwald is an associate professor of environment and sustainability with an appointment in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan. And he joins us now on the line from Ann Arbor on what the science says. Professor Grunwald, it's good to have you on TVO tonight. We want to start by just showing a split screen of uh, the same spot a few years apart. Sheldon, if you would, there we go. There's the picture. This is the same spot in Owen Sound on the shores of Lake Huron. The top picture from three years ago, the bottom picture from this year. And what we see, and I'll just describe it a bit for those listening on podcast, uh, looks like two entirely different locations. The water levels are just astonishingly different. And I wonder if you could just help us out by explaining what would account for such dramatic rises and falls in water levels. Sure, Steve. Well, one thing that's important to remember about the Great Lakes and Great Lakes water levels is that they do vary over time. If you look back at the long historical record of water levels on the Great Lakes, you'll see that all the lakes, particularly Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, can vary by up to one to two meters or up to six feet over periods of decades. This most recent change that we've seen going back to around 2012 or 2013 when water levels were at record lows took place over the period of about three years and was one of the most rapid increases in the recorded history of water levels that we've seen. And in a nutshell, that change was triggered by a combination of increased precipitation across the entire region, which leads to higher water levels, but also, and importantly, a slowdown in the rate of evaporation. And we believe that that slowdown was triggered in part by the very, very cold winter of 2014, triggered by the Arctic polar vortex deformation, that big blast of cold air that came in, froze the lakes and slowed down evaporation. All right, I haven't heard you use the two magic words yet though, climate change. Did that play a part? We right now are doing a lot of research to try to differentiate what we refer to as natural variability on the lakes from the impacts of climate change. However, what we are, what we're proposing or what we think is happening right now is that climate change is having almost a two-fold impact on the Great Lakes and in particular on water levels. First, climate change is tending to lead towards an increase in precipitation across the entire region. And so you'd think that that in and of itself would lead to higher water levels. However, climate change on the Great Lakes has been shown to also lead to increasing air temperatures and increasing water temperatures on the lakes. And what that would naturally lead to, towards uh, with higher lake temperatures is higher evaporation. So what we have uh, as a result of climate change on the lakes are these two competing forces on water levels. Higher precipitation which at times will lead to higher water levels, but also at times higher evaporation, which will lead to lower water levels. So what we've seen recently here is what we like to refer to as a tug of war between these increasingly or these stronger forces. And at times, if one of them lets up, so to speak, as evaporation did in 2014, the, the pendulum could swing and water levels could go up. And we believe that that type of swing is in fact a consequence of climate change across the region and the continent. I don't want you to think this next question is too crazy, but I have to tell you, as somebody who spends a, a, you know, a good chunk of time on the Great Lakes, I hear this frequently, and that is on the question of why water levels were so low just a few years ago, many Canadians apparently believe that Americans are stealing our water. You want to comment on that? Absolutely, Steve, and I think you and I had a conversation about this not long ago around that time period about the very same question. Um, one thing that's important to note is that there are very strong governing bodies, in particular the International Joint Commission, or the IJC, takes the matter of water diversions between the United States and Canada very, very seriously. And some of the federal agencies involved, including the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as Environment Climate Change Canada, they work very closely together behind the scenes year-round to ensure that water is diverted equally among the United States and Canada in accordance with the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909. So the chances that there's an excess of water being diverted to one country or the other um, is, is really almost implausible. What, um, what it is important to note is that this is actually a binational exercise and that the data sets that we put together to account for all the water do come from both countries and we need both countries to cooperate to get that data set right. 
Okay, let me share some numbers with you and our listeners and our viewers. Uh, these are from the Government of Canada expressing what the Great Lake levels are. Uh, the Government of Canada calculates a 100-year average, apparently, of the Great Lakes, and here's how it's stacked up. Lake Superior was apparently 35 centimeters above the 100-year average. They combined Michigan and Huron together, and they were 79 centimeters higher. Lake Erie was at 80 centimeters over the average, and Lake Ontario was 74 centimeters over the average. Now, you've explained how this has happened. I guess what I want to know next is, should we be concerned about this? So the question of concern has a lot to do with how comfortable people are with hydrologic extremes and what benefits and what damages there are when water levels are either too high or too low. In general, when water levels are very, very high or there's an abundance of water, people tend to get pretty uncomfortable and in fact there can be damage to property and damage to lives. So I would argue that when we have extreme flooding across areas like Lake Ontario, across Western Lake Erie and other areas, we should be concerned and we should be concerned right now about the impacts of that flooding and we should be concerned about the extent to which it might continue or recur in the future. However, part of the challenge in the Great Lakes is that we're not on the marine coasts. The Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, portions of Canada and the United States that are dealing with marine water level rise are really dealing with the, the, the singular problem of water levels increasing. And the challenge here on the Great Lakes is that Water levels are likely to be high again as they are right now, but there's also the possibility they could be low again at some point. And that's a challenge for management authorities to plan for both extremes. Is it an indication, though, that somehow, and you forgive the lack of, um, uh, of a technical term here, but that nature is somehow out of whack and we're the cause of it? That's a good question. Um, it's, I would say, an even bigger part of the challenge here is to make a decision about whether or not to plan for longer periods of highs and longer periods of lows. You know, one of the ways we like to phrase this is that for a management authority, if water levels are going to be high for a period of time and then they're going to be low for a period of time, I'm not entirely certain if that impacts a management authority in a different way than if water levels are high for a short amount of time and then they're low for a short amount of time and they oscillate back and forth that's a question uh, to which the response may differ depending on whether you're a homeowner, a commercial boat user, a residential boat user, or some type of larger management authority. Sounds like you're saying, though, that this new volatility is going to be the new normal, and one way or another, we've got to figure it out. Is that right? I hesitate to say that anything is a, a new normal. We have a lot more research to do to see what is likely to happen in the future. But in general, Steve, I would argue that being prepared to plan for both extremes over time is, is a wise move. We have talked to numerous people on this program about the impacts of climate change and, and whether one can draw a straight line between, for example, climate change and you know, whatever the latest disaster is happening, whether it's Dorian or Katrina or whatever. So let me pursue that with you for a moment here. D can we say categorically that climate change is a factor here because things seem to be happening in a much more volatile way than they ever did in the past. So it, it, would, be, it would be almost impossible to completely tease out or separate climate change from what we're seeing here on the Great Lakes. Great Lakes water levels are impacted uh, by a combination of temperature, precipitation, solar inputs, which eventually lead to changes in precipitation and evaporation. So those, the, the things that are happening on a global scale and a continental scale with changes in temperature and changes in precipitation are in fact changing water levels in a way that would make them different from what they would otherwise be. Hmm. The question of whether or not the extremes that we're seeing right now are directly attributable to climate change is a little bit trickier um, because it's possible that water levels could be high right now. That's research that we're working on to try to tease out the extent to which water levels are high just because of climate change right now relative to what they otherwise would have been, that's a tricky question that we're, we're continuing to work on. So would you be one of those experts who would say to the people watching this right now or listening to this right now, here's what you have to do in your lives differently, and if you do, there will be less volatility in the Great Lakes water levels. Can we say that? I'm not quite at that point yet. The, where I am right now in the conversation, Steve, is that as you're preparing for how to interact with the coastlines in the future, be wary of the idea that water levels may fluctuate in a way that's a little bit different from the historical record. 
uh, and that we need to continue looking at whether or not they're going to stay high for longer periods of time, low for longer periods of time, and whether the change between those extremes is likely to be more rapid. Can you say whether or not it's actually better to have it be one way or another? In other words, do we do better when the water is more low than high or vice versa, or does it matter? That question depends an awful lot on how you interact with the coastline. I'll give you a couple examples. When water levels are very high, as I mentioned earlier, most people, whether they're homeowners or, or residential boat users, are pretty uncomfortable. It makes it harder to access docks. Um, there can also be damage to property. Uh, there can be erosion and even flooding. However, there are groups for which high water levels are a benefit. One of the most readily apparent is the commercial shipping industry. When water levels are very high, the large commercial ves vessels, which are absolutely critical to the regional economy, have a much easier time navigating through some of the shallower parts of the Great Lakes, particularly the channels that connect the lakes. Now, there is an interesting point that when water levels get very, very high as they are right now, sometimes vessels have to slow down as they enter marinas and ports because of waves and, and overtopping on the shoreline, and that can lead to having them slow down. So in general, very high water levels are, are not a benefit to a lot of um, sectors of the economy and people. But again, when water levels are low, there are pros and cons as well. But I would argue that when water levels are low, um, the, the disadvantages outweigh the advantages. When you look at the industrial sector, particularly folks who rely on the Great Lakes as a source of water intake, whether it be for industry or drinking water, um, sometimes the infrastructure is not designed for when water levels are very low. It can make it very hard to safely draw water from the lakes when water levels are that low. However, on the flip side, for the recreational uh, cottage industry and the beach going industry, when water levels go down, there can be a lot more beachfront and a lot more beach area. And we tend to hear from folks that they appreciate that, especially in the summertime, when they want to go enjoy the Great Lakes coastline. Right. I got about 20 seconds left here, which is enough time to ask you whether even you, with all of your expertise, are you able to predict what you think the Great Lakes levels are going to be in 5 or 10 or 15 years? We're not, Steve, and I'll tell you why. Part of the challenge is that the factors that affect the Great Lakes water levels, in particular temperature, precipitation, evaporation, they're driven by processes that they themselves are hard to predict. The example I gave you earlier of the Arctic polar vortex deformation is one of the best examples I can think of. That Arctic polar vortex deformation, that blast of cold air, dramatically altered the trajectory of water levels, yet that was something that nobody could have predicted two or five or seven years in advance. Drew Grunwell, we always appreciate your taking our calls from the University of Michigan. Great to have you on the program again from Ann Arbor. Happy to be here. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.